Go for Excellent. It. I can see that we're recording now. So welcome again, everybody, to Big Data Module 2, Technology Foundation. Uh, Matt's told me that he's got a few extra things in this other than what we originally planned. Uh, so it should be a big night. And uh, really, there's not much more to say. Remember to put everyone in the little blue uh, thing when you're doing the chats so that just not the hosts and panelists, i.e. us, can see it. And other than that, uh, everybody have a great night. Welcome to Lil, who's doing the moderating and chatting to everybody. And uh, my name's Shane. And you'll hear from me a little bit more because I'll ask the questions and help with some other things as well. But now it's over to Matt, who has held the fort during my delightful breakdown. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shane. And uh, welcome everyone back to our second week module uh, for Big Data. So tonight, the, the basic plan was to go through Technology Foundation. So have a look at some of the uh, some of the underlying technologies that, that are used in big data uh, and software systems that we alluded to last week. But before I go on to that, I really just wanted to do a, a little bit of a, a I guess, a, a small recap or a little bit of a discussion around a couple of really good questions that were asked last week and that I thought deserved a, a bit more of a detailed answer because I, I thought they were very they were clever questions. I can't remember who uh, asked them. Uh, our apologies. Um, and I think there might have been a few people that asked questions of a similar ilk. So uh, to those of you that asked this question or were thinking about it, these answers are particularly for you. So thank you for your questions. So there was uh, some discussion about the different types of data that's used in, in big data. So we've got our unstructured, structured and semi-structured data that we talked about last week. And one of the really uh, quite a you know, obvious question really was to ask, well, uh, if structured data is easier to go through and easier to uh, search through and, and to uh, generate useful outcomes from, then uh, is there some way that we can turn unstructured data into structured? Uh, and of course, there is. There is a way that we can do that. There's a certain process to doing it, and there's several tools and techniques we can use. So I wanted to spend a, you know, just five or ten minutes just talking about those. Typically, this whole process of taking our unstructured data, which of course can be of many different formats, as we saw last week, to turn it into a structured format that then allows us to build relationships between the different components of that data and to come up uh, with uh, more useful outcomes and useful outputs is a really important thing that uh, enables us to then be more efficient in our use of our big data infrastructure and be able to get through a lot more information in a shorter period of time and to get to our outcomes uh, in less time than we otherwise would be able to. But it requires a little bit of back-end work around pre-processing, potentially extraction of, of, of data from data sources to put them into a different form, and really using a set of different transformation techniques. So in other words, taking our uh, data from unstructured into a more structured format. And that may be that we would take multiple components of an unstructured data set and split them into two structured data sets that are more relatable. So the first one is obviously the data collection. So we get that in from lots of different sources that we spoke about last week. And we were talking about text documents, different types of images, audio, video, uh, social media feeds, uh, reporting, uh, so the sort of data that I was talking about with the accelerometry data. So it might be uh, uh, taken from uh, wearable devices. It might be taken from GPS devices or any other type of IoT slash IOE type device, as well as our traditional data repositories. Once we've collected that data, then it's about, okay, finding out, uh, and we're talking about from an unstructured term here, uh, once we've taken that data, we then have to decide about what pieces of that uh, data exist that are going to be interesting to us, given our context, whatever it is that we're trying to look for, determined by whatever outcome, reporting outcomes and outputs we sort of desire. The second stage is this data pre-processing. So that's could be cleaning, 
So in other words, removing noise or other artifacts of that data or components of that data that aren't going to be relevant or useful to us. So it may be that we've got certain uh, video or audio files as an example, and there's only parts of them that we're going to use for our own purposes. So we need to clean the rest of that up so that we're only looking at a smaller data set rather than a really, really large data set. Now, or uh, actually, let me rephrase that, looking at smaller files rather than larger files, because of course we've got a huge amount of data because we're pulling it in from a lot of different sources. We start to also do some error correction in there as well. So that might be to do with the way in which the, the incoming files have been stored or the way they've been captured. So it might be uh, some sort of transmission type error, or it could be factual based on factual errors as well. We then might do some normalization. So this is converting all of our, for example, converting all of our text to lowercase or uppercase, if we like, or removing special uh, characters that are not going to be meaningful or meaningful to us, such as things like asterisks, maybe, or uh, exclamation marks, or maybe hashtags or things like that may not necessarily be relevant for what we're looking at. So we need to think about, OK, how can we put this data into a format that's going to be useful for us? We can do some data passing and what we call tokenization. So tokenization is simply breaking what we've got into smaller chunks, smaller, more manageable um, blocks or chunks. Now, in the example here, it said words or sentences that we can do that using natural language processing, but we can also do that with other types of data as well. And then passing is about extracting the parts that are meaningful to us, given our reporting context from the data repository that we've got. So for example, if we're looking at emails, we may just want to extract the sender, the recipient, the date that the email was sent or received, and the content of the message. We don't need the other SMTP or MIME uh, con constructs in there as well. So obviously with email, there's, as, a, as that example, there's a lot of different information that's included in that to enable email to flow from source to destination. And, and we don't want that. We just need sender, recipient, and maybe the message content. Data transformation then is the feature extraction. So we identify and we take out the relevant features or attributes or desirable components from that unstructured data. So for example, for text, that might involve taking out some keywords, some particular uh, named entities or organiza organizations or topics of interest, uh, or what are called sentiment scores. We might do some entity recognition. So we're trying to pick out names, dates, locations, events uh, that are relevant to us from within that, uh, that uh, set of data that we're looking at. We might then want to take that data and categorize it and label it based on certain criteria. So we might extract things like names and dates and locations and assign them to uh, certain categories. So it might be, say, if we're looking at social media feeds, we might look at, uh, pull out some names and locations, and we might classify them under uh, their popularity of the target audience that we're going to publish these outcomes for. Or it might be, we might look at people who are famous, for example, and people who are semi-famous, so globally famous, famous in our country, famous in our state, or they might categorize them into types of work that they do. So it might be looking at politicians, uh, people in the media, people on television, people on reality TV shows, those sorts of things. It doesn't matter how you categorize or label this data, it's all going to be dependent on, as it says there, your predefined criteria, which is going to be related to the context in which you're using this big data. So if you're a, a uh, someone like, um, say, Amazon, for example, you're going to try and pull in information about customers and what they're buying to be able to better market to them or better sell to them, as an example. Data structuring is then uh, mapping what we've taken 
out of the unstructured data through all these different processes and then restructuring it in a structured format. So a nice organized relation, relational type structure that allows us to bind different data sets together in an intelligent way. So for example, uh, if we're talking about as Amazon before as it was, if you're processing customer reviews about uh, products that they've bought, or potentially it might be say someone like eBay who's processing customer reviews on either things they've bought or sold, so seller and buyer reviews, then we can restructure it in, you know, by review rating or review ID, a ID or customer name. So like for eBay, it would be the eBay username, the rating based on their five-star categories, the date it was published, and of course, any other information in the review text, which is usually you know, A++++ type thing. And then once we've done that, put it into a format, which we can then easily search using typical uh, search engines or searching uh, algorithms, we can then, we then need to store that in that structured format. So typically that might be in a database, uh, in a data warehouse, because remember we're talking now we've converted into structured data, so we'd use a warehouse, maybe a data lake if it's sort of semi-structured or for the rest of the residual data that we've left unstructured, we may also put that in the data lake because remember warehouses are usually for structured, data lake usually for unstructured. And then that allows us to have more of our data in that structured side, which then makes it a lot easier for us to query and analyze that particular data and thus turn it into useful information and outcomes. Some of the tools that we can use for that include natural language processing. We typically use this on text data for obvious reasons given by the name. And we use that when we perform our, our tokenization a process named entity recognition. So again, this is, is coming up with topics and key phrases that we're going to recommend, uh, recognize. We've got our OCR, which of course converts our images of text into something that our digital systems are able to interpret intelligently. We've got speech to text conversions, which we use on our audio files to convert that into text. Once we've converted these things into text, we can go back to NLP and use those to break down the actual individual components. We have things like Pandas, SQL, or other specialized software that can help us to manipulate and transform that unstructured data into a structured form so that we can store it in a more uh, efficient, and uh, cost-effective manner, but we can also search through it and query it in a more efficient and cost-effective manner and well. So for example, suppose we have a collection of emails uh, for a customer service department, which of course we know from last week are classified as unstructured data. And we want to turn that data into a structured data set that we can search and query and report on really easily. So what sort of things what might we be interested in pulling out from that? It could be things like the date the email came in, the customer name or their email address would also make sense. The issue category or issue severity, uh, resolution status as well. So whether it's been fixed or not to the customer's satisfaction and potentially some detail about what the actual body of the, the, the body of the message was regarding that particular issue. So we extract the date from the email header, for example. We could also extract the, uh, the uh, email address from that as well. We could identify the customer's name, either through the content, the email address, if we've got that relationally linked to a customer database that already exists, or some form of signature that they have on the bottom of the email, potentially. We can determine maybe the issue or the uh, severity of the issue using keyword matching or machine learning models, which are becoming more and more prevalent now. We can also determine the resolution status from uh, the backwards and forwards. So the email trial, if you like, so follow-up responses, email trial, or specific keywords uh, coming back from the customer, or maybe even being initiated from 
uh, our end as well, our customer service end. So indicating, you know, thank you for your, uh, thank you for reporting this issue. We have da, 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 done X, Y, Z. The issue should now be resolved. Alternatively, you might get an email back from the customer saying, thank you for that speedy resolution. Uh, everything is now okay type thing. Once we've done that, we can then put that into basically some form of database most typically, which can then be used to quickly analyze, report, or otherwise link to other database systems that we may have, as I said before, like a customer database system. So we can link that maybe potentially through customer name or probably more usually uh, customer email in this particular example, because there may not be a customer ID uh, within this email trial. Customer emails are, are typically unique, so we can link it via that way. The other question that I thought was really worthwhile revisiting was um, just briefly talking about big business that have used big data to make business decisions. And you'll see uh, these are some technology and internet-based companies that have used big data uh, to analyze a, a whole mass of incoming unstructured, semi-structured and structured information they've got from their different sources to then decide how they're going to run their business or what the, what direction they're going to take their operations. So as an example, Google uh, uses these technologies uh, in their search algorithms to target ads and to personalize searches for individual users. Amazon does it to target you with product recommendations to manage their inventory and to fluctuate their prices based on market need. Facebook, of course, I don't think I need to talk about that. I think we're all well aware that uh, that's particularly targeted to what we're looking at and what we talk about. Netflix is the same, looking at what people are watching uh, and recommending specific and personalized shows, movies, uh, whatever, sporting events to particular I, subscribers. I don't, Sorry, know you, I don't know if you remember, but Netflix offered a million dollar prize about mm, yeah. 15 years ago. Uh, one of my acquaintances put a solution to them for that uh, option. And uh, oh. he got very close, actually. He took an entirely different approach to the one that they ended up using. Um, but yes, it was. Uh, they were very concerned about all, all of this. You like this, therefore you must like that recommendation. Appears to miss the mark for most people. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, there you go. Well, there you go. It's, it's a shame he didn't. Yeah, he'd be quite wealthy by now, I would think. Yes, I think he's he's quite upset. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, yeah, Microsoft. So that was uh, that was another example there. But if we then have a look at some other industries that you might not necessarily think of, so finance and banking, for example. So there's some big uh, American companies there. Uh, some of them have been involved in some very sticky situations over the last 15, 20 years. But anyway, so they, uh, Morgan Chase, for example, fraud detection, risk management, customer segmentation. Goldman Sachs for market analysis, trading algorithms, investment strategies. Okay, so they can they can analyze instead of having a room full of people trying to do this, they put it through these big data systems and they come to a output, get to an outcome a lot quicker than they otherwise would have. And even though it is, it's definitely possible to add some humanistic flair to it. Uh, we speed up the the process uh, infinitely faster than we would just by having it done uh, manually, so to speak. Although nothing's really done manually nowadays, but uh, on a on a lesser grand scale, if you like. Some other ones, media and entertainment, so Spotify and Disney are a couple of recommendations. And again, you'll see a theme with these. They're talking about recommendation, content recommendation, user behavior analysis. So this is customer insights, which is really talking about, which is really user behavior analysis. How are they using the system? What insights are they giving us? And targeted advertising, marketing. Let's face it, pretty much the same thing, aren't they? Um, travel and hospitality, Airbnb, Expedia. Again, we look at what they're talking about. Pricing strategies, customer experience optimization, market analysis, customer service, personalized recommendations, all very all variations on a theme, regardless of the industry that we're actually looking at. So there's some there's just some quick 
uh, and dirty answers, I guess, uh, for some of the questions that came out of last week that I thought were uh, quite useful, quite good questions, and it was worthwhile having a, a look at some of these. Now, as we now move into the second part, which is the original content for week two, keep in mind that a lot of these companies here, because I'm sure this question will come up, but a lot of these companies here that are listed in these couple of slides here also make use of the uh, make use of the technologies that we're going to talk about tonight. I wonder so, if we should uh, have a couple of questions on that, and uh, let's try and roll a rule a line. And a number of them have been answered in the chat. I can see, which is great. Um, okay, but maybe we can quickly. Um, clear them up. Uh, how do you see the future of cloud is in big data, data processing? Will it completely replace on-premises setups or will we go into some sort of hybrid? Uh, look, I'm still a bit old fashioned. I, I think at the moment um, that there will still be a need for some on-premise uh, it, it, look, uh, let me clarify the context first. If you're just talking about information and data gathering and processing of that, then I, th I think uh, cloud is is going to be the way that things will be mainly driven. There, some of the larger companies, bigger companies, will probably have may have on-premise stuff. And as I said, I'm a bit old-fashioned. I, I still like the idea of... Uh, some industries, particularly those that are heavily regulated or have uh, heavy privacy concerns to have a lot of that um, or some of the, at least part of that on premise, part of that data that they may need on premise. But uh, yeah, cloud's here to stay. It's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and for all the obvious reasons, uh, most of the reason that we're shifting to cloud is because it helps us to move things from, uh, you, know, you know, from one side of OPEX to CAPEX type thing. So, uh, sorry, great cap, CAPEX to OPEX. So, um, <laughs> you know, instead of having to buy our own equipment and, uh, and uh, you know, fund our own systems internally, we can shove it off to someone else who's got a much greater capacity, can scale up to much greater, uh, can scale up a lot more. We've got much better resiliency. Uh, we've got great SLAs. We don't have to worry about a whole heap of things other than really looking, depending on the sorts of cloud environment we buy, we may not have to worry about anything really other than the actual data that we input into that system. So if we took as something like a SaaS cloud-based system, then we're really only worrying about the, the data that we put into it. Everything else, including security, et cetera, et cetera, is handled by the provider. Of course, driven by our needs, but uh, it makes things a lot simpler. Um, and then, of course, when you talk about that, we... You know, we, we have the other side of it, the doom and gloom about certain jobs going out of vogue and all that sort of thing. I don't think they will. It's just that they'll shift from being in the in the enterprise space to the provider space. Well, if you think about it, um, you know, two of the biggest cloud providers, basically, it's just the extension of what they've already done anyway. So it's their private mm. cloud. They've just taken it public. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have ever have LLMs taken over? I assume that's large learning models or large yep. language models yep. have taken over from NLP specific algorithms, or are there still advantages to using NLP tools? Uh, I don't think LLMs have yes. uh, taken over. They will eventually. I think that's that's probably the way it's going to go. I think there's still value in, LR, in NLP systems in some context. Uh, but yeah, the large uh, language models are, are certainly going to take over uh, into the future. Um, I, but again, we've got to, I think we've got to be mindful that although, uh, you know, although some people think that AI is reaching a fairly good level of maturity. Uh, I mean, we're still a long way from where it's going to get to, I think. So um, AI, LLMs, you know, machine learning, all that sort of jazz is is only going to get better and better. So I think there's still room for NLP at the moment. Absolutely. Well, let's. I won't interrupt you anymore. Let's uh, continue on. Okay. Thank you, Shane. All right. So storage systems. Um Basically, we're just going to have a brief look at uh, why it's important or how it's important that we scale and uh, scale our storage systems because clearly as you uh, start to grow your 
um, sources of data that come into your systems and, and potentially the types of data that comes into your big data environment, we need to be able to scale or be agile in our ability to scale up. Uh, and clearly we need to be very efficient in the way we uh, store our, our data. Uh, and that sort of harks a little bit back to what we were talking about before with this, this discussion between unstructured and structured data. Uh, if we're nice and efficient in the way we can store, then we be it becomes more efficient to then query and search, particularly when we have massive data sets. There are obviously challenges in storing massive amounts of uh, data, particularly in the diversity of the sorts of uh, data streams that are coming into our big data systems. And one of the most commonly, or one of the, I shouldn't say most commonly, but one that is often used is the uh, Apache Hadoop system, which is as an Apache-based system or, or uh, Apache-associated system, it's an open source framework. And it's simply a model for distributed storage. So in other words, having lots of different machines provide storage space for whatever it is that you're trying to store. And also, uh, distributing that processing load across the multiple platforms that are connected via this Hadoop system. It's commonly utilized by companies that want to look at vast amounts of data. So some of the, if we just skip back to these slides here, uh, in particular, um, Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, I'm not quite sure, I can't remember, but Amazon and Netflix, and uh, was there another one that I had here? Spotify, I think, was the other one that make uh, that that use Hadoop um, almost exclusively, and there's they're not the only ones. There's other ones uh, clearly, but they're the ones I can think of off the top of my head from that list. As part of this system, we have this distributed file system. So yes, it's an open source framework that allows you to distributed processing, but the, the underlying mechanism that's most important is this ability to be able to distribute the files or the contents of the, the data that you're bringing in across multiple um, platforms while ensuring that it is still accessible when you need it. So if you've got things, um, uh, parts of data sets over different uh, multiple processing uh, and multiple platforms, then you need to be able to retrieve it in a timely fashion, clearly, if you're trying to query from it. We also need to have that ability for it to be fault tolerant as well. So uh, while, yes, distributing across model platforms gives you an element of fault tolerance, obviously, if you have one um, part of that system go down, then you're losing that part of your data, whatever that is. So there needs to be mechanisms in place, much like uh, if we look back to RAID systems, for example, redundant array of inexpensive disks, where we put multiple disk drives together, uh, upon which we, uh, one of the mechanisms we used to use was to stripe data across multiple disks, so that if one disk died, we would still have access to, say, the other three or four in that array to be able to look at our data. Of course, the problem with that is we lose, in that example, if we've got four disks and one dies, we lose or uh, we lose all but um, we lose one of those parts of the the data, which may or may not be super important depending on what's on it. And so then we would implement another um, idea where we uh, inserted another drive and we used that as a CRC or a parity checker. So we'd have four disks for data and one for parity, so that if we lost one of those disks completely, we were able to rebuild it from that parity drive. Slows down the system, of course, but it becomes more fault tolerance. And there's always going to be that trade-off between performance, uh, convenience, and fault tolerance. So HDFS does that really, really well. The other really good thing about it is it's designed to run on freely available systems. So you don't have to buy any specialized hardware or any large scale hardware to be able to run it. You can run it on a desktop PC or a laptop. Okay, now, obviously, for larger companies that have lots and lots of data, they're not going to do that. They're going to run it on large hardware systems. But it's it's still useful to know that even on a smaller scale, you can invest in 
relatively inexpensive hardware and still be able to enter the, the big data race, so to speak. So the key features of it is it is able to support very large scale, large scale storage. And we're talking many, many exabytes of storage. Very good performance, so high throughput. Again, that's a little bit related to the underlying hardware, clearly. Uh, fault tolerance, as I said, very important component of it. So these are three the three key features of this system. So for example, um, if you're a social media platform, I'm not going to say which one, but I guess you can guess, uh, storing user-generated content around text, images, videos, other sorts of multimedia, you could implement that using HDFS, uh, have it distributed across multiple systems, multiple platforms, have it fault tolerant. So your people who are generating that content are always going to be happy uh, and content that their, their content is available for use whenever. Oh, so here's some examples. I'd forgotten I'd put this in. So yeah, Amazon One was, was one of them. Oh, Facebook was one. Okay, so who uses how to? We have Yahoo, who were one of the early adopters and contributors to it. They use it for web indexing and analysis, as it says. Facebook uses it. Again, similar to the example I just gave. Uh, LinkedIn for data analytics, activity tracking, and again, recommending, making recommendations to people using the system. X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and Amazon. Used for various things, including on their AWS systems and their EMR systems as well. So again, using big data to help inform their cloud-based services as well, or model their services. In terms of retail and e-commerce, Walmart uses it. Um, one of the big ones they use it for is, a, is the supply chain management, inventory optimization, and customer analytics. Yes, that's that's um, that's a that's a theme that's pretty you'll see pretty regularly across all the users. The supply chain management is um, uh, very important, obviously, to Walmart, given they offer an unbelievable range of products uh, for people to be able to purchase. Now, eBay again for similar things. Again, there's there's themes in this analyzing transaction data, customer behavior, so that we can better target customers and advertise to them products that they might be interested in. Searching optimization, obviously that's important for customers as well, to be able to jump onto eBay, search for what they're looking for and have the right answers come back to them as quickly as possible. So they can buy exactly the products they want as quickly as they possibly can. Target. Uh, uh, also uses for customer segmentation, again, personalized marketing, supply chain analytics, so similar to Walmart up here. So you can see there's there's variations of a theme of a theme across all of these different industries. If you look at automotive, car data analytics, vehicle performance monitoring, um, and that's a, actually I'll give you another example in a minute. Uh, Ford. Related to vehicle design, production, customer insights, Formula One, uh, most racing categories, but Formula One in particular has unbelievable amounts of uh, telemetry that come from the cars uh, while they're testing, while they're uh, in, in practice, they're in qualifying and during the race. They've got hundreds and hundreds of sensors on the on the car on these F1 cars all the time for you know temperature readings, fuel readings, performance readings, emission readings, uh, all sorts of different faults. That that data is shipped across uh, very fast links back to their head offices, their factories, most of which are in England, which is uh, rather odd. But anyway, most of the F1 teams are based in England. And for every race, they have a group, all the engineers, everyone back at the factory, looking at this data being processed through these big data systems to tell them what's going on in real time with their cars as they're actually racing. And you think about the the size of the systems and the capacity and the power they need to uh, to to, tra to um go through that sort of data. And then on top of that, they're doing testing all through the year on new designs for the car for next season. So you're talking about a whole heap of wind tunnel stuff that they do. Um, and then all the practice they do, all the, t all the practicing they do with the different tires that they use. Um, so there's a lot of information and that's that's just one small segment of the motor racing, uh, motor racing industry. Uh, energy and utilities, other ones, so BP, Exploration, product data and production data analysis, so a little bit different 
to to some of the other ones we've looked at. Uh, again, Duke Energy, managing and analyzing data for smart grids and energy consumption. Okay, so working out how can we how can they best distribute the energy to their customers when they need it? How do they get around um, surges in demand? Okay, how do they get around grid issues when they have power outages uh, caused by unforeseen acts? Helps them with that. There's also no SQL databases. Okay, so literally no SQL databases, which are designed to handle all our different types of data. So our unstructured, our semi-structured, and our structured. So this offers great flexibility to the way in which we to to the the way in which we have to store our data. So we don't have as big a reason to convert our unstructured data into structured. Should we don't should we not have the resources or time or or people to be able to do that? Of course, uh, regardless of whether it's able to handle those unstructured and semi-structured data, it will be more efficient if we're trying to query structured data, and that's just simply because of the nature of that type of data. Now, what was the other point I was going to make? Oh, oh no, that was a no, that's all right. Sorry, I was getting myself lost there for a minute. Um, so there's a lot of different companies that will use NoSQL data as well. Uh, and some companies, in fact, uh, use these uh, use this on top of their Hadoop environment. So don't think of these as being mutually exclusive. They're not uh, use one system or the other. Uh, when you think of it, these are th these are they're still databases, so we're still able to actually do what we would normally do in a SQL type database environment. but um, they're not constrained by uh, by the fact that you have to use, structured query language to pull information out of them. So we can use them. There's a lot of flexibility in the way we can interrogate the information within these data within these databases. There are some different types um, of databases. Some of them are listed here. Again, that's not exhaustive. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the all the different types because there's a lot of them. Um, but as an example, uh, a lot of e-commerce platforms will use the Mongo database, uh, so which is document-based to then uh, provide uh, catalogs, user reviews, uh, again, for targeting their customers with various products. So who uses SQL and NoSQL? And as you'll see, some of the same names uh, on this list as well. So Google was from before. Amazon also used Hadoop as well. Um, Facebook used Hadoop. X used Hadoop. Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so there's a number of um, companies that you know, use multiple components here. So as I said, they're not mutually exclusive. In the retail, again, there's Walmart. They're another one. Uh, eBay, Alibaba uh, use NoSQL database as well, or a version of NoSQL database. And you can see uh, here that uh, Couchbase, MongoDB, Cassandra, HBase are all these different types of NoSQL database. Which NoSQL database you're going to use is going to be dependent on the products and the type of business that you're going to be in. So as it says here, uh, document, column, key value, or graph based um, will be dependent on the actual uh, industry that you're in and how you're trying to interpret and query the data that you're bringing into your big data system. BP and Duke Energy also are users of NoSQL databases as well. So you can see there's a lot of overlap, uh, and particularly within industry sectors. Would Any we questions like to on quick... that? Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go on, Shane. Absolutely. Um, okay. Does ha how does Hadoop handle real-time data processing and what's its limitations? Uh, I'm not going to... Uh, I probably can't answer that adequately, to be frank. Um, I'm not an expert on Hadoop, but it is well that um, I will uh, gather information for, and I will answer that next week if I can, because okay. that's a really and, good question. And the follow-up to that is that this person has read, Praveen, has mm. read that small files can cause problems for Hadoop. 
I'm assuming uh, like, you know, for big data applications of, you know, um, just very small amounts of bytes of data. Uh, that that could, that the, the, the way that that would make sense to me is because of that distributed architecture and keeping track of where those small files are. That, that's certainly something that uh, previous <clears throat> older iterations of distributed file systems have trouble with. So generally they like to work with big files rather than small files. So I, I couldn't give you a definitive answer on Hadoop specifically, but certainly uh, other distributed file systems, not quite to the grand scale of that, but uh, suffer a similar fate, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Emma's asking, well, if NoSQL can handle structured um, queries anyway, why would we bother with SQL? Oh, well, simply depending on the topic. If, if all you've got is using, if all you're using is or mainly structured data, then um, you could just use a SQL system. So it's going to depend on the sorts of sources of uh, the source of your data, what type it is. I mean, there, there is a lot of unstructured stuff, but as I said before, when we're talking about turning unstructured into structured, yes, you may gain input from a lot of unstructured data, but there may only be certain parts of it that you are actually using within your context. So it makes sense then to pull that out, convert it into structure and to put it into a simple SQL system. Um, there are a lot more options for SQL systems and uh, for even open source versions and, free, and freer or cheaper, less expensive versions. What you could see with NoSQL is that uh, you have different types of NoSQL systems, which you would have to, you need to be able to choose or um, implement a particular NoSQL system that's that's targeted directly to the type of data that you're working with. So while NoSQL is possible, you can look at the three different types of data with it, you still have to target it specifically for the type of data that you're looking at. So document-based, column-based, so on and so forth, or image-based. image, uh, image based. Whereas NoSQL, uh, with SQL databases, so long as it's structured, it doesn't matter what the attributes are you're looking at, you are able to use it. So there is still a place for SQL databases for sure. Um, does the storage of data in large quantities in either MongoDB or Cassandra have limits or is it effectively unlimited? Uh, it, he also asks if it's safe, but I'm assuming that's really more around the infrastructure around it. Yeah, well, I would say in both those cases, it's around those. So, I mean, um, to be honest, uh, I don't know if there's a theory. There may be a theoretical limit in terms of the system itself to how far it can scale, but in terms of um, in terms of how much data you could store, there's really not much of a limit to that now. Um, and storage systems are so vast now. Distributed storing systems are so vast that uh, yeah, I, I don't. I couldn't see there being a limitation on that, to be frank. No worries. Uh, you've answered the whole pile about international companies. Any idea what Coles and Woolies use? No. Which are, for those who don't know, they're the big Australian supermarket chains. No, no, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, no. I can find out, but no, I don't know off the top of my head. No worries. And are there any other open source programs that can be used or used by other companies besides Hadoop? Uh, there are there are other systems. There are actually, yeah, there are other open source. Uh, Hadoop is the most popular um, because it's it's considered to be the most mature at the moment, um, and it's uh, it's obviously cheap because it's open source. There are other source platform, other open source platforms that are in development, um, but haven't been widely adopted as yet. And um, there's, I think there's a, uh, I can't remember too many of the names off the top of my head, to be honest. Uh, but there is, there is some uh, information on that on in the week two resources. Great. Okay. Let's move along. All right. So the processing frameworks. So what, what we're looking, looking at here is just basically the types of models that, that can be used to process these really large data sets that are in place, not only uh, be, uh, because we're looking at large sets of data, but because we're looking at large sets of data that are distributed across 
uh, potentially multiple storage and processing platforms. So we need to have a model that is appropriately scaled and appropriately programmed to be able to uh, work with these distributed type systems. So Map MapReduce is one of these, and I think I've got some examples of who uses it coming up shortly. Uh, one of its key features is it simply makes data processing a lot easier across really, really large data sets that we're talking about using in, in big data. So for example, if we were looking at analyzing a whole group of server logs from say uh, an AWS platform or set of platforms, um, this would be something that MapReduce would be able to do quite simply and quite efficiently. Another one uh, that is really commonly used, again, is an Apache-based um, system called Apache Spark. Again, because it's Apache-based, it's open-sourced, and it's a, it's a specifically targeted analytic engine that is built to work with, obviously, the Hadoop platform. So these two are quite commonly used together for obvious reasons coming from basically the same stable. Uh, it allows you to work with SQL. Uh, or NoSQL as well. It allows you to uh, stream, it allows you to work with machine language and graph processing as well. So starting to think about, uh, starting to project forward into the future and where um, uh, machine learning and language models are going to potentially go and opening up a, an avenue for that integration down in, in, a, in a later time. Uh, so, so key features of that in memory processing. So we don't uh, literally have to, we can do it actually in the the memory of these distributed systems as well. Real time data processing. So as it's coming in, it's being um, used, it's being processed and spat out the other side. So uh, there's no delay uh, in between reception and output. And fault tolerance as well built in, part of it's built in through Spark, part of it's built in through that Hadoop uh, distributed system platform. Uh, again, real-time data analytics is what we typically look at uh, for this particular implementation. As it says, it's a unified analytics engine, so it makes sense that that's what it's mainly targeted at. Uh, in this example, financial trading systems, but it could be used in any sort of uh, application across a number of different industries. Uh, okay, so there was a question that popped up here. I just saw. So the question is, is map reducing use already? Please help with companies or industries that make use of such. I like the idea that large data sets can be reduced. Um, I thought I did have some examples of companies, but I obviously neglected to put that in. So I will, I will uh, defer that until next week. I'll answer that next week for you. But yes, it is, it is in use at the moment. Um, not as I said, it's not hugely the the larger companies that I was talking about before in the previous examples. Uh, I'm not aware that any of those companies use it. Um, so I will find that out for you for next week. Any other questions? You want me to answer Shane before we move on? Um. Fair to say that Hadoop works with NoSQL while Apache Spark works with SQL. Uh, in yeah, the, the optimization is that yeah, it's optimized to work with with that in that way. Yes, so um, it, it's better with uh, uh, SQL structured um, data sources. Yes, I think they'll do us. Um, I mean, it's probably a good time to just have a quick break now and give you a bit of a chance to pause. I should probably uh, talk. This is where we pay the bills, I suppose. As those of you who've been doing our short courses for a long while will know, we also provide master's and graduate certificate degrees in conjunction with Charles Sturt University. Uh, it's Charles Sturt that actually gives you the degree and confers them when you get through. And during our short courses, which we provide for free, we always just talk a little bit about what we do in the rest of our organization so that you've got some idea about some of the things in our courses, if you're in case, maybe interested along the way. One of the reasons that we offer the short courses is to give everybody practice in how we present our normal on online degree courses. So that if you haven't studied 
for a while or maybe ever, then you can get some confidence in what's going on. And it gives you an idea of the sort of level and what's expected outside of things like assignments, which are a little bit more complex and demanding in the actual courses. So, you know, IT Masters and Charleston University have designed a set of courses primarily around IT-based subjects such as cybersecurity, uh, cloud and virtualization, and networking and sysadmin, and some uh, adjoining things like um, project management, and there's an MBA program as well. The, the, the good thing about the MBA is it's truly unique. It's the only one we're aware of that allows you to do part MBA program in management subjects and the other part in your specialization. So you can actually do cybersecurity as part of an MBA and then get both management um, upgrades if you like. So you can move up to the next ladder in your uh, corporate world and at the same time experience more about what you need to do. Thanks, Harry. I'm glad you enjoyed the MBA. Um, many of our, if not most of our students actually don't have undergraduate degrees or have only got limited previous um, uh, studies. And so the way to get into a postgraduate degree in those circumstances is via your resume and your work experience. And you submit it to us and we make a decision about uh, whether you can get in via a grad certificate or not. The general benchmark is around about 18 months, two years or so of relevant work experience. There is one course in which that doesn't quite apply in the same way, and that's our graduate certificate in career transition, which is designed for people that want to come into the IT world from another area, in which case the work experience doesn't have to be relevant, but we do need some work experience and to know what you're doing with your life so that we can make a judgment. As it turns out, most of the people that do our courses, they actually pass them more regularly than people through the general courses around and they attend better they do better in assignments it's quite a good setup because we uh, we have seemed to attract a very motivated group of students virtually forever since we started and we started back in 2002 and we've always been online and we're one of the pioneers of that there's a couple of unique aspects to what we do as well uh, one is industry certifications a lot of you listening here tonight even may have things like uh, CISP or some of the Azure or Amazon certificates or Microsoft ones. There are about 220 or 230 of those that we've actually assessed against the requirements of our subjects. And we will give you actual credits against those subjects in our degrees. Uh, they all apply to the parts of the courses that we teach and they've been approved by Charles Sturt, uh, Charles Sturt as well. So that, that has been very thoroughly documented and approved. So if you do have some of those certificates, it can actually reduce the amount of time that it takes for you to uh, get a degree. As Lily's put up, you know, browse our credit finder and you can look through the 200 plus. Um, as I said, our MBA is fairly different. Um, We've, uh, we've been doing this and we are looking at new courses all the time. You'll find that there will be some new courses we hope to pop up. It takes about one to two years to get a new course off the ground, partly because the way we do it is that our courses are 50% academic and 50% industry. So people like Matt, and in fact, Matt is one of our most famous and well-known mentors. Uh, he teaches subjects that are much more industry-based and so they tend to be a little bit more up to date is possibly not fair, but they're more relevant to industry concerns. And also on the other side of it, we get the Charles Sturt subjects that are taught. And that is a model that virtually nobody else offers as far as I am aware. Uh, we've got a question asking if we offer a PhD. We did offer a doctorate and that has been taken off the table temporarily or possibly permanently, mainly because we have not been able to find enough people to uh, help um, uh, mentor the graduates because you have to be a doctorate, you're a doctor yourself in order to be a supervisor for it. So temporarily that has been suspended. There are PhDs that you can do through Charles Sturt that are very similar, although they're slightly more research based. Uh, the other thing that I would like to mention, and you know, if you want to find out more about our courses, I'm sure Lily will put up some various links, but you could speak to one of our course advisors about how to plan it out. One of the things that we have realized is that with some of the government grants that are available now for graduate certificates, you can end up doing a whole master's for about 
30 to 45 percent of what it would normally cost by the time you've been through one or two graduate certificates and then gone on to the master's um, master's degree in the area that you want uh, if you speak to our course advisors they can take you through that process it's it's quite easy and it's quite uh, a proven and that's uh, that sort of covers things like scholarships uh, which we don't offer specifically at the moment and just in passing, I will mention, by the way, Matt, that the next short course that we'll be offering is on a Palo Alto certificate, the name of which I cannot remember, but it is one of the ones, it's one of their initial ones. Um, so we'll be uh, promoting that in about a month, about probably two or three weeks after we finish this one. Anyway, that is probably more than enough for me at the moment. And I apologize if I have blathered my way through that. But uh, let's go on and let's have a look at virtualization. Matt's obviously gone out for a. No, it's uh, all right. I'm here. I just uh, I just forgotten to press the uh, unmute button. Uh, okay, so thanks for all that, Shane. That's excellent. Okay, that gave me a bit of break and uh, a bit of time to uh, loosen the voice box as well. Um, just. Uh, before we go on, there was a couple of questions that I answered uh, just uh, as we were going along there. So thank you for those. Um, one of the questions that someone asked was, oh, around about uh, MapReduce, who uses that? So and I was saying I wasn't quite sure. So I just had a quick look. And as it appears here, uh, there are many of those large companies that I was talking about before actually do use it. So Google, for example, uh, uses it as uh, in an effort to help us help them index all the different resources that are available on the web that they they give you uh, answers uh, on their search engine for. Amazon use it apparently. Um, Yahoo use it for web indexing, log an analysis, and data mining. Facebook use it. Uh, X use it, so formerly known as Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn. Um, e commerce, lots of e commerce companies like eBay and Alibaba, which we've mentioned before, um, a lot of academic research in institutions, which is interesting. Yeah, large scale sim simulations, processing might, might be something I need to look at for what I'm doing. Um, and Netflix uh, is another one that apparently uses it uh, again for their log analysis recommendations and customer data analytics. They use it to squeeze things down so there you are there's the answer to that question for you so thank you to whoever provided that question hopefully that was uh that was the answer to it i don't think there was oh no worries thank you i've seen your reply there okay um okay i might just leave those other questions for a little bit later okay so virtualization part number three so what's the role of virtualization in big data well, clearly, we know that virtualization allows us to create multiple virtual machines on a single hardware platform, which all the cloud providers are doing. And obviously, a lot of private companies are doing that as well and shifting their services from uh, individual hardware platforms to a shared environment. This is an this is these are a lot of advantages and these sorts of things. We can add memory, we can well, we can add and take away memory quickly and easily, storage capacity quickly and easily, processing capacity quickly and easily, allows us to scale both vertically and horizontally, whatever direct. So we can add another server in, or we can just make an existing server bigger if we want to, more powerful, more give it more resources. Gives us lots of flexibility. Uh, and, and very quick. Very, allows us to be agile, I guess is the right word. So we can be flexible, we can scale, and we can do that really, really quickly. So again, the, if we hark back to uh, our Hadoop platform, we're able to create multiple virtual machines, lots of different virtual machines for our just different customers. If we're a provider, we can run Hadoop across all of those, and therefore we've now got ourselves a distributed uh, processing and storage system. VMware is uh, probably the world's leading provider of virtualization software, well-known, very mature, 
well-developed, available across a number of different platforms and in a, several different economies of scale, if you like. So you can aim it at sort of a desktop environment where you can run multiple smaller machines on a desktop or you can scale it all the way up to their ESX type technology. Really nice and simple point and click web-based management or application-based management. Very good performance, uh, runs really well across the uh, huge amounts of different um, hardware platforms and has really good built-in intrinsic security, uh, not just uh, in accessing the actual management or the system itself, but also between machines as well. So it allows you to seg segment them off much like you would do in an MPLS VPN type environment. We, by uh, the way, we also have a, uh, a short course on VMware 6, I think, and that will be updated in during next year. Ah, very good. So very popular. So that, that would be quite a good course to get on, I would say, because VMware is a big part of the virtualization world. So if you've got VM skills, you're always going to be in demand somewhere. Of course, Docker uh, has also been making huge leaps and bounds in previous in uh, in uh, in the last few years. Uh, so this is where we can containerize our individual um servers or systems, if you like. So much like a individual virtual machine, but we can run these dockers or docked stations within these virtual, within individual virtual machines as well. This also allows us to um, build or, or build applications or platforms within these very modular units that we can then ship off elsewhere or copy to other places and simply run as a standalone entity. So they're very flexible, very scalable, very easy to deploy, and and certainly very easily to, to deploy quickly uh, and cheaply. Lightweight, portable, scalable, pretty much sums them up. So they're, they're very easy to, to set up. They're very easy to uh, scale very quickly to either downscale or upscale, uh, and they're very easy to deploy. So in this case example here, we could use Docker to just to deploy a uh, Spark application uh, for uh, data processing purposes. I was just looking at that spelling there. It should be real time data processing. I was trying to work out what real time data processing was for a second. Uh, Kubernetes is another open source platform which allows us to uh, quickly deploy, scale, and operate containers, much like Docker. What Docker's are containers. These are containers as well. Uh, allows us to orchestrate, scale, and provide resilience quite easily and quickly. Big data in the cloud. Okay, so this, I think, is our last section for this evening. How are we going for time? Okay, all right. So big data in the cloud. We Most of us will be aware of cloud computing and the different deployment models, different service models that are available in, in the cloud environment. And there's many cloud service providers now. We can either, we can even uh, provide our own private cloud. We can use a public cloud. We can use hybrid cloud environments. We can even buy, uh, implement our own private cloud inside a public cloud if we wanted to. So there's lots of different... Lots of different cloud combinations and permutations that we can now implement. Of course, the great advantage of it is we can, as I said before, we can vertically or horizontally scale our systems incredibly quickly at incredibly low cost by comparison to deploying our own our own hardware. And uh, a lot of the responsibility is shipped off to the service provider depending on the model that we use. So as I said before, if we were to purchase a software as a service model, then all we really have to worry about as a customer is the data that goes into that model. Outside of that, everything else, patching hardware, software, security, performance, uh, resilience, everything else is taken up by the cloud service provider. At the other end of the uh, at the other end of the scale, we can buy a uh, platform as a service, for example, or um, hardware as a service. So servers literally just buy the server hardware itself, and then build everything on top of that. So it's dependent on what we're sort of after, what we're looking for. But but either way, even if we just look at whether we're looking at just purchasing a hardware model or a software model, it still enables us to 
almost literally snap our fingers and have an increase in performance and capacity at any time that we so desire. Uh, again, so if we look at something like Amazon AWS and and the serve the cloud services that they provide there, that's that's an example of where we can actually pick and choose the exact level and system that we want to run within their cloud environment. So almost a private cloud within a public cloud type idea. Uh, major cloud providers, AWS is and Google are probably the two uh, big, really big players in that market. Also, Microsoft with their Azure platform. Uh, key features, storage, Hadoop processing, data warehousing, uh, data laking, all those, all those sorts of features are available uh, through AWS. Um, so they, they, it's not just that they're they're targeting cloud services on uh, bespoke systems or sort of typical corporate systems. We're also able to have a uh, cloud-based big data system as well, um, uh, completely uh, implemented for us. Uh, Microsoft, as I said, with the Azure platform, uh, they have a number. Again, they're using um, uh, Hadoop in conjunction with a thing called HD Insight. Uh, they provide data laking as well and Databricks. Google, uh, obviously a big one. They use data warehousing uh, primarily. So in this case for BigQuery, so BigQuery data warehousing leads itself more to structured data rather than unstructured data. Oh, and that's the end of that. So that, that was as far as, oh, there you go. It was quicker ended than what I thought. So what questions have we got there, Shane? Um, we've got a couple. Actually, I, I was interested in this one from Steve. Big data seems to focus on collecting, analyzing, using, and storing. But has there been an increased focus recently on data disposal after a certain number of years so that companies aren't exposed to hack on hacks on customers who left them years ago? I would imagine that some of the big hacks here, such as Medibank and Optus, would uh, come into play there. Yeah, absolutely. Um Again, it, it's. I think it's. I think it's dependent. Oh well, not, not with this. Um, how am I going to wear this? I, I guess the, what I'm thinking is, I, I wouldn't necessarily think there's a an increased focus on the disposal of data. Um, I think there are still a many businesses, many, um, lots of there. There would be. A lot of data out there that would never be disposed of. It would just sit there forever and a day. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, you may, it, there may be reports that these sorts of things are more focused on. I, I think that's exaggerated. Um, unless you're in a, an industry that revolves around finance, uh, private health information, like say personal identifiable information, government, military, or some sort of intellectual property, then then I don't think you're going to get too much of that data uh, uh, aging and um, disposal. I think you'll find that um, a lot of these uh, sort of systems will actually retain the data because it enables them to provide more comprehensive responses to the the queries that we that we pass into them yes ray said you know some data's disposals monitored by regulation i would imagine there'll be more of that over time because 11 years for example seems a long while to keep the data from a customer that may know yeah as i said it's going to depend on the if if you're anywhere in any sort of industry that requires that then uh, or requires some sort of level of secrecy or privacy then yeah that that would be there if there's not already regulations in place, uh, that will certainly happen into the future. And I know the Australian government are already looking at um, some industries with that sort of regard. But nevertheless, I still think there's going to be a lot of data out there that will just be held indefinitely, um, because the more knowledge you have, the you know the the better outcomes, better outputs you're going to give uh, when you. Uh, or going to produce better out the outputs you're going to produce when you can perform these sort of queries. They largely depend on the industry. I, I, th I think that's the way it's going to go anyway. Could be wrong, but that's what I think. Um, what are the challenges of managing and monitoring big data environments in the cloud? 
Uh, well, they're exactly the same as the challenges of managing and monitoring any sort of environment, whether it's in the cloud or locally. Uh, so you need to monitor all sorts of different components. So you've got your typical, your security, your access, your performance, your resilience, uh, things like your uptime. Um, how how uh, so? How can how can people access it when they need it? So effectively focusing on your CINA, your confidentiality, your integrity and availability. So I, I think it's, uh, I don't think there's really any difference between whether you have a system remotely or locally in terms of what the generic overall requirements and challenges are of that. Obviously, if you've got a system directly in front of you, that's connected to your network, then it's not quite as challenging as it would be as if you were, say, purchased a um, platform as a service type system that was in the cloud. But remember that, that, that you don't always have, you're not going to have all that responsibility anymore for that managing and monitoring. So some of that's going to be shifted over to the service provider. And then it's down to you to determine whether that's a particular service provider is going to provide you with the requirements for managing, monitoring, uh, resilience, security that you require from your own particular business model. Uh is I'm not sure that this is the uh, actually going to work. Is Hadoop integrated with AI? Is Hadoop integrated with AI? I think they're probably. Or, or you're saying maybe the Twain shall meet really? No, no. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure. Are we asking is it integrated or can it be integrated or? I, I don't know. It, that it was what was there it, in the question. I, I yeah, would imagine it, that Hadoop is the basis of much of many uh, LLMs, isn't it? Well, exactly right. So uh, it definitely can be integrated with AI. Absolutely. So remember, it's an open source framework that we're talking about um, for that distributed storage and processing of our of our big data sets. Uh, so it, yeah, it. I couldn't see why it wouldn't be uh, used in quite a lot of AI systems. I mean, there's a lot of AI platforms out there, but certainly for data storage and processing, it would be a perfect platform for AI. Um, for integration with machine learning libraries, it would be useful for that as well, or, or um, pre-processing, data pre-processing. Um, what other thing? Analytics um, that could be powered by AI engines as well. Um, so yeah, there's a number, and there's probably others I can't think of off the top of my head. But yeah, there's there's plenty of opportunity I think to use Hadoop in AI environment for sure. Great. Um, is big data in the cloud susceptible to cyber attacks? I assume the answer is yes. What? How do oh, you absolutely. That? Yeah, absolutely. Just like any other data stored in any other digital environment. Um, I, I guess that you know when we talk about cloud computing, we know that because it's distributed and we know that it's that it's very scalable, then then there are some challenges and potential vulnerabilities that can certainly be exploited. So um, absolutely, absolutely can be exploited. So obviously any system that's connected to the public internet has the uh, capacity and capability to be uh, attacked depending on how it's secured, how it's patched and how it's deployed. For sure. Great. Um, while AI and big data together can contribute to predictive analytics and forecasting, there is the other side. What are the implications of merging AI with big data for data privacy and security? Mm, that's a good question, isn't it? So I, I, I guess you know the, there's a lot of there's a lot of advantages to uh, merging the two together when we think about analytics, making business-focused decisions, automation of tasks, I guess. Um, but there's, there's also obviously those concerns which we've, we've sort of touched on in a couple of questions around, uh, I guess, data privacy and security. Um, so, yeah, there's, some, there's definitely some challenges with that. Uh, and 
I mean, I'm sure there will, there will be challenges, further challenges that will, will come about too as we as we progress into this big data slash AI aids that we haven't even thought about as yet. But even if we just sort of thought about data privacy, um, when you think about data collection and processing with respect to AI, obviously, if you've got an AI system, you, you need a lot of data to train it in the first place because AI systems don't just you know you don't just give them a data set and and ask a question and they give you the perfect answer they're they're not quite that clever obviously yet so they need to have a lot of data put through them in order to train them correctly to be able to interpret and then spit out the right answers or at least as correct answers as they can possibly give based on the data that they've got. So that, of course, means that you've got to collect more data, you've got to store more data, and you've got to process more data. And the more data you collect, store and process, the greater the risk that it could be, um, you know, attacked or compromised in some way. So, yeah, yeah. Um, The other and the other interesting one actually, which I've been doing a little bit of work on in another sort of totally unrelated field, but I just thought of it was that, and we talk about in in research space uh, when we collect data, uh, lots of large data sets from participants in our research studies that when we write about those research studies and we analyze that data, we have to de-identify it or anonymize it, if you like, so that we can't identify who the participants are simply by looking at their data. The more data you collect and store, so the larger the data set you have, then it could, depending on the data, I guess, be uh, easier to identify maybe patterns, correlations within that data that might allow you to re-identify individual participants, I guess, or people that have been involved in in that um, giving, giving of their data. So, I mean, there's just a couple of yeah, absolutely potential risks in it. Yes, uh, there's been some famous cases, haven't there, where people have, uh, Google has de-anonymized, uh, sorry, has anonymized data, but people were able to figure out the answers. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So one more question um, and, and just a comment. Apparently the virtualization video links in the study guide were no longer available. Um, oh. So we'll have a look at that. For okay, yeah, I'll we'll have a look at that. that. So apologies for that, if that's the case. I thought I'd actually checked all of those resources when I put them in, so I must have missed that one. Apologies for that. I'll I'll see if I can find the right one for you. Uh, would we agree that big data brings a storage capability which makes the storage of data infinitely too appealing to not collect the data? You know, even in data regulation, you know, even in areas where it's extremely regulated, such as the EU with GDPR, et cetera. So the purpose becomes less meaningful. Let you know, me break people, it down. People are collecting data because they can, basically. So what was the question? Would you agree that big data... Are we? Uh, is it too tempting, I think, to, to paraphrase it, is it too tempting to just collect data because we can? Oh, um, purpose. yes, I, I would. Yes, I would say uh, an unequivocal yes to that. Um, that, that that's a that's a that's a yeah, interesting question, because yeah, I mean obviously big data technologies uh, bring with them immense capabilities of storing data, and and as we were sort of talking about before about this sort of goes back to that point about uh, getting rid of data uh, after X amount of years, like you know for example your tax records you don't have to keep for seven or ten years or whatever it is I don't know my wife does all that but. Um, before you have to dispose of them so um it, and i guess yeah it's a bit like the old garden shed mentality you know the bigger the garden shed you have the more you'll you'll keep in it so yeah i guess that that could well be an issue yeah for sure keep it indefinitely yeah particularly if you if you think about um some of the highly regulated countries that we know about uh, so, you know, that the governments that carefully and closely monitor what their citizens do through the internet, it, it, that could definitely be a problem. You could see problems arising from that, yeah. Well, on that note, I think it's well and truly time to wrap up. Thank you so much, Matt, for another fantastic week. 
uh, next week we're up to week three and we look forward to seeing everybody at the same bat time same bat channel uh, thanks also to Lil for the uh, being quick on the keys and uh, getting everything out there into the chat tonight. And thanks everybody in particular for coming along. We had more people turn up this week than last week, which says that it must have gone well last week, Matt. Yeah, well, thankfully that that's that's fantastic. So yeah, thank you everyone for your attendance tonight. Uh, uh, and uh, I think there's a couple of other questions that I, I think uh, out, that were outstanding tonight that I'll come back with some extra answers next week. So I look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you to Shane and Lil for the help tonight. No problems. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>